You've probably heard someone talk about going to find themselves. This phrase implies that there's something missing from us that we need to have in order to live full lives. Yet like the man in today's episode, the things we find leave us empty. So is there anything that can really fill that hole? Let's find out. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. (laughs) Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, bringing you the story of a lonely man who tried thing after thing to fill the void in his life. But at the end of the day, nothing satisfied. On today's episode, we'll see just who could replace the empty space with meaningful purpose on this Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Also, you'll want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize that you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The true story of Billy Crone. Okay, God, you haven't helped me, and you don't seem to care about me. I'm gonna make a deal with Satan, and he'll give me the things I need to make my life bearable. I'll give him my soul. Oh, oh, oh God, I gotta get out of here and get help. I don't wanna die. God, help me. Billy, what happened to you? You're bleeding all over the place. I shot myself with Dad's rifle. Oh, get in the car. Come on. I've got to get you to the hospital. Good thing I came along when I did. You would have bled to death out here alone. The man in our story was 17 the day he attempted suicide. It wasn't the first time. This is the testimony of how he reached that point and where he went from there. It's the true story of Billy Crone, right now on Unshackled. My family lived in poverty in southeastern Kansas. I was the youngest of four with two older sisters and a brother. When I was born in 1967, Dad farmed, and our house had no running water. Two bad winters exhausted his credit, and he had to shoot rabbits for us to eat. Mom and Dad fought about finances, so when I was in sixth grade, Mom got a job, leaving us kids alone. Hey, sis, what's for supper? Macaroni and cheese. Again? If you don't like it, go hungry. How come Mom isn't home? She's working overtime. That's all we do in this family, work, work, work. You don't know what work is, Billy. Ah, I do so, Terry. I cut the grass in summer and shovel snow in winter, and I keep the house clean. Well, make sure you don't mess it up while I'm gone. Uh, Where are you going? I have a date tonight, Nosy. You're leaving me alone with our stupid sister? Last time she threw knives at me. Oh, and I suppose you didn't do anything. No! I don't want to hear anymore. Go set the table. My family had nothing to do with Christianity most of my life. We attended church for a time when we lived in Nebraska, but after the young pastor was replaced by an older pastor, my parents quit altogether. They said we kids could decide for ourselves what to believe when we got older. After mom started working, we got into all kinds of trouble. Each of us ran away at one time or another. Alone in the house one day, I cried out to God. God, if you're really there, I need some help. My family is so messed up. What's going on? What's happening? God, give me a lightning bolt or something. After two hours with no sign, I said, Fine, God, I am an atheist. I didn't even know what an atheist meant. I just thought it was somebody who hated God. I had no one to talk to except my dog, Charlie. This was the 1980s, and a friend offered me something to ease the pain of reality. (laughs) Good stuff, huh? Yeah. (laughs) I'm so high. I never want to come down. Told you. 
My folks buy the best. Man, I love being high. Nothing matters. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it's all a bunch of baloney anyway. What? Life! <laughs> so, how do you want your baloney sliced? Thick or thin? <laughs> what do you want with your baloney? Butter? <laughs> yeah, I want to be buttered up! <laughs> <laughs> Me, I want the works. Everything I can get. Everything life has to offer. With drugs and alcohol, I got into all kinds of immorality. My parents rarely drank and never used drugs, but they were gone so much. The lyrics of rock music urged rebellion and selfishness, and those rock stars were my idols. I was 17 when I made a deal with the devil, and within two months, I tried to take my life with prescription drugs I found at home. That failed, and my girlfriend broke up with me. That's when I shot myself with my dad's 22 rifle. My friend rushed me to the hospital. Later, my sister and brother came to visit. Billy, I heard you got shot. What happened? It was an accident. Pretty hard to shoot yourself in the side with a 22 rifle. I'm a good shot. If I wanted to blow myself away, I could. Whatever made you do it, it isn't worth it. I don't want to talk about it. Dad been here? Yeah, he didn't say much. He never does. What about Mom? She was pretty unhappy with me, so she went back to work. You're lucky you're not dead. Yeah, I guess. We've got to get out of Kansas before it kills us. When all the attention died down, my girlfriend dumped me again. And life went back to the same old emptiness. Drugs left me depressed, and my grades suffered. I literally wrote a term paper at the last minute just to graduate. I was already working with my dad in the brick factory that he managed, but finances were tight. One night, a friend asked me to go drinking with him, but I was flat broke. So I stayed home that night and cried about my poverty. A friend called me the next day. Hello? Hey, Billy. Did you hear about Lauren? No, what? He was killed last night. Oh, man. What happened? He rolled his car coming home from a bar. A didn't have the top on it. You know those T-bars? Broke his neck. He called and wanted me to go out with him, but I was broke. Your lucky day, Billy. You might be dead, too. I cried for hours, and again at the funeral home, I lost it, crying uncontrollably. Looking at him lying there, I wondered, what's going to happen when I die? Our friends who said they were Christians didn't seem to have answers either. I cannot describe the anguish of my soul. Where could I go for solace? My older brother called me with a suggestion. Come on out to California, Billy. Leave my job? That's a big decision. You'll love it here. No shoveling snow, lots of fun in the sun, and pretty girls. Most of all, opportunity. Can I live with you? There's no room here at Uncle Ron's, but you could stay with our cousins. Later on, we can get our finances in order and we, we can get an apartment together. You think I can get a job there? Yeah, if you cut your hair and shape off. Seriously? I am being serious. You can work construction with your cousin. Yeah, that's true. I'm going to electronic school and you can too. In time. You have to live here a year first. Then you qualify for a student loan as a resident. I'm tempted. You gotta get away from home if you ever want to get ahead. Uh, maybe you're right. Education is the key, Billy. Education is the answer. So I moved to California, cut my hair and stopped using drugs, trying to reform myself. After a year, I started nights at the same technical school my brother attended. But education didn't fill the void in my life. I still drank and made good money in construction, so I started using drugs again. My brother and I got an apartment together. What is this? Leftovers, all mixed together. Remember that time Terry made chicken and it was green to the bone? <laughs> She must have used green food coloring. Oh yeah, I still don't like chicken because of that. <laughs> that was around the time she got religion. And still has it. Every time she writes or calls, all she talks about is Jesus. Yeah, I know, it sure gets old. Hey, what do you say I bring my girlfriend here to live? The one in Kansas? Yeah, 
If nothing else, she can cook better than us. Maybe I'll bring mine too. We could use a woman's touch around here. My brother and I invited our girlfriends to live with us, which didn't work. So I got my own apartment. I tried to find meaning in my immoral relationship, but it was the wrong kind of relationship and not the right person. And it didn't fill the emptiness in my heart. I didn't know why I felt so empty inside. My sister thought she knew the answer. Hello? Billy, how are you doing? Fine, Terry. How about you? Hanging in there? Better than that. I walk with the king. What king? King Jesus. He's the almighty king. Cool. Hey, I want you to know I'm a blonde now. You're kidding. Why would I kid you? Billy, Jesus loves you just the way you are. Maybe, but the girls love me as a blonde. God looks on the heart. I bet he's eyeing my new stereo, too. Don't be irreverent, Billy. Who's being irreverent? I heard you say he's omniscient. He sees and knows everything. You said nothing escapes his attention. Yes, that's true. But he's looking for an upright and willing heart. That's me. Willing to try anything. Education did not fill the emptiness. So I decided to concentrate on making money. And I earned enough that I had trouble knowing what to buy next as things became my god. But possessions didn't fill the hole in my heart either. When I ran out of things to buy, I turned to drugs, and they ushered me into the darkest time of my life. Folks, we'll get back to Billy's story in just a moment, but first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org, and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, Unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, let's get back to Billy's story. One day, a guy at work took me to a bookstore during lunch hour, and I saw a whole new world of ideas. Interesting, huh? Look at all these subjects. Life after death, the spirit world. Oh, you'll like this, writer. Man, I didn't know this stuff existed. Yeah, the more you read, the more you want to read. You think these books hold the answers? Well, to what? Where did we come from? Why are we here? Oh, they expand your consciousness and make you think. <laughs> that happens to me when I get high, so I'm all for that. Oh, grass is just the beginning, Bill. If you want to have a deep mystical experience, try using LSD. <laughs> I dove deeply into the writings of this cult and tried many other religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, shamanism, Eastern mysticism. I might have sunk under the weight of all those ideas, except for another man at work. Rhett came alongside me with a completely different approach. What are you reading, Billy? A book about changing your destiny. Is it a Christian book? <laughs> Not a chance. Well, the Bible warns us to be careful because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Oh, and how do you know the false prophets? Easy, my Bible says. Well, here, I'll read it to you. What's that? Pocket Bible. It says, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. Nah, Jesus Christ, huh? 
He's the only way I know to change your destiny. <laughs> You're kidding, right? It's true. You have to know Jesus Christ as Savior. There are two kinds of people on earth, Billy. Those who know him and those who don't. If you know him, you go to heaven. If you don't, you go to hell. So that's how you change your destiny. Oh, come on. That's the most simplistic thing I've ever heard. Yes. God made it absolutely simple for anyone to get to heaven. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. You really believe that? Absolutely. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. <laughs> Get out of here. Christians are so gullible. Why don't you come to my house for supper sometime and meet the family? They might change your mind. I ate with his family, but continued to make fun of Christians. He invited me to a Christian singles group where I refused to bow my head in prayer. As various people asked for prayer for loved ones, I mocked them by asking about prayers for the dying slugs and snails of the world. So my friend prayed for the dying slugs and snails of the world. He put up with my insolence, even buying me lunch when I ran out of money. One day he stopped by to see me. I just came to say goodbye, Billy. You're leaving? Yeah. My family's moving back to New York, so I'll probably never see you again. Have a good trip. Remember what I said, Billy. Any time, any place, all you have to do is ask the Lord to save you, and he will. Yeah, don't hold your breath. I only knew Rhett for about a year, and when he was gone, there was no one to tell me about the things of God. I labored on in darkness, still deep in New Age beliefs. I was equally deep in psychedelic drugs. I used crank, weed, coke, whatever was available. Dude, I am really wasted. <laughs> Me too. That doorway keeps melting like molasses. <laughs> <laughs> Look at Eric down there on the floor, twitching like a frog. <laughs> He's about to OD on crank. Why does he always push it to the edge? Looking for the ultimate high, Billy Boy. Man, everybody here is so wasted. Why not? You ever wonder what it's all about? Don't start that again. I, I just... I just wonder, that's all. I mean, where's it all gonna end? Who cares? Live for today, because tomorrow you might be dead. That's what I'm afraid of. What happens then? Then you deal with it. Oh. <sighs> Why is it so cold in here? Oh man, you know what that means? Yeah, the hairs on the back of my arms are standing up. Mine too. Oh, here it comes again. Harry? The, the dark one? <laughs> yeah, you see it? Don't worry, he doesn't stay long. Hey, everybody! Look! Oh, too late. He's gone. I'd been having blackouts, but this was different. This was an apparition, a dark figure that popped in and out so much, we named him Harry. Terror gripped me whenever he appeared. I thought I was going insane. So I laid off LSD for a week, but I kept using speed and alcohol. The next Saturday night, I was at a river party and tried acid again. I blacked out, and the next thing I remember is waking up on my friend's bedroom floor. His dad was calling him. Come on, Mike, get up. It's time for church. Uh, uh. Come on, it's Easter. You gotta go to church. We're leaving in an hour. Oh, no way. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, man, what a hangover. Oh, this is the worst one I've ever had. And I have to go to work tomorrow. They probably have coffee down there. Go pour yourself a cup. Coffee didn't help. So I went home to my apartment. My brother and I were rooming together again, but he was out of the country. And I was alone. My headache pounded, so I drank some vodka and boom, there he was, the dark apparition again. I ran to my bedroom, 
and fell on my knees praying for my life. Oh God, if you are really out there and you want this life, you can have it. I repent for the way I lived. Please save me, Jesus. Oh, oh forgive my sins and save me. Instantly, I had a clear mind. Instantly, the demonic figure was gone and never returned. Right away, I knew to dump the ungodly things in my life. The demonic music, CDs, and tapes. I had started to write a New Age book, and that went in the trash along with every single book I owned. The first person I called was my sister, Terry. You're saved? Glory, hallelujah! I've been praying for you! Boy, do I feel good, Terry. I literally could feel the weight of sin get lifted off of me. Isn't it wonderful? I wish I had known. I wish I had listened to you and the guy at work. He'll be glad to know what happened when you tell him. I don't know where he is. He moved back east. Speaking of moving, I'm coming to California for a visit. Soon? In two weeks. You look great, Billy. I'm glad your hair is back to its natural color. Yeah, I did that last Christmas. God was preparing you to be his child. I used to think that kind of talk was silly, but now I understand it. And you're going to church? Going to church so much, I think they're tired of looking at me. And reading the Bible? You need God's word daily. Uh, nobody had to tell me that. I can't get enough of it. <laughs> you're born again, all right. Every newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word. That's how we grow. Yeah, nobody had to tell me to get rid of all my drugs and books, either. I just knew they were evil. That's the Holy Spirit, Billy. Jesus says in John 14, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Do you think I'll ever be able to quote things like that? Of course. It still amazes me how he saved me, just like that. That's always how it is. In an instant, you're whisked from the doorstep of hell to the kingdom of God. Then God sanctifies us, grows us. That takes time. Man, I am sure glad you and Rhett kept telling me about Jesus. When I wanted to turn from Satan to God, I knew what I needed to do to get saved. Spend time in prayer, Billy. I do. I keep asking God to show me more. I want to know more about him. I can't think of a better prayer. I want to go to Bible school. Great! I called a number in the phone book, and the lady that answered started laughing. Said, this is a vacation Bible school for kids. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? You'll learn. From now on, the Lord will help you. We lived in Sacramento, and there were two Bible colleges there at the time. So I began to pray about going to Bible college. In the meantime, I tracked down my friend Rhett's address back east and called him at work. Billy Crone. Haven't heard from you since I left. Rhett, I wanted to tell you that I'm saved. Oh, man, listen, guys. This is the guy I was telling you about. He's saved. Billy! Billy! Stop Isn't that great? God answered our prayers. Holy Rhett, God. are you still there? This is fantastic. You can't imagine how much I prayed for this guy. How stubborn he was. Rhett, I understand now. Billy! Billy, you still there? Yes. <laughs> Have you recovered? This is great news. Oh, well, hold on to your seat, buddy. I'm going to Bible college. Fantastic. I've been praying about it, and let me tell you how God showed me which one. I'm listening. I'm at work, unloading a container full of hundreds of boxes. Took me hours. Yeah? And I get to the last cart, and I'm dragging it over the lip of the container, and all the boxes fall over. And the very last box on the very bottom had a little piece of paper hanging on by a piece of tape. And it was a pamphlet about the very Bible college I was praying about. I figured that was a sign from God. The Lord is good, Billy. You made the best decision of your life. He was right about that. Eight weeks after I was saved, I started Bible college. And that's where I met Brandy. We married while I was still in school, and I began pastoring a church before I graduated. I stayed with them for two years after graduation. Then I pastored a church in Northern California for five years. In April 2006, 
God called us to Upper New York State to pastor a church. The first Sunday I preached, God had a surprise for me. So you see, folks, if God can forgive me, He can forgive any of us. And I'll tell you what He'll give you. He'll give you a clean slate. He'll give you, through the cross of Christ, an endless supply of life. He'll give you direction and purpose in life. You will no longer be afraid of dying. And that emptiness in your heart that we've all had will be replaced with a heart full of joy and love unspeakable. I close with these words from 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let's pray. Good sermon, Billy. Brent, good to see you, buddy. Same here. Oh, that's right. You live around here. Yep. I heard you were preaching today, and I wouldn't have missed it for anything. See what you started way back in Sacramento? Who knew it would lead here? The Lord started it, Billy, and he's faithful. Amen, brother. He'll finish the work he's begun in us. I expect you to do a mighty work for him here. I'll just tell them what you told me from the beginning, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. I want to meet your wife and children. Right this way. She's the pretty blonde over there. In the 18 months I've been here, our church has grown by more than 100 people. My sisters and brother all profess faith in Christ. You don't have to wait for a lightning bolt. God hears every prayer that comes from a sincere heart. His grace is free, and whosoever will come to the cross will find new life in Jesus Christ. That new life is for you, listening friend. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you need help in making this crucial decision for Christ, we encourage you to call 1-888-NEED-HIM, or you can get in touch with us here at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, the prize for this sweepstakes contest is yet another beautiful wooden scripture plaque. The verse on this one is Romans 5, 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This specific plaque has dark brown bark and a golden center. The scripture is written in light green color that makes it pop. If you'd like to take a peek at this scripture plaque, you're welcome to visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page for a picture. Folks, unfortunately, we are only able to mail this plaque to locations within the United States, so our drawing is limited to U.S. addresses. 
But if you reside in the U.S., all you have to do to enter our sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. That's your name, phone number, and email. The winner of the sweepstake for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced March 20th, but the deadline for entry is March 4th. We look forward to hearing from you, and next time... Oh no, I gotta get out of here. Roger Munchian could feel the walls closing in on his lifestyle of crime. Free, on your knees. You don't understand. You don't understand. His ambition led him to create a multi-million dollar business, but much of it through devices of illegality and corruption. I heard you can pick up quality weed, and that's what I want. Now, all right, what about goods? I lift electronics, TV, stereo, sometimes jewelry. From now on, we're putting together a customer list, and we're hitting every night. <laughs> all right. But his attempt to go straight and walk away from his drug trafficking empire would have its own consequences. Let me see your hands. I take it you're not here to inquire about an insurance policy. You have the right to remain silent. Don't miss the true story of Roger Munchia. Coming soon on Unshackled. Heard in the true story of Billy Crone were Brian Plaharchik, Jennifer Dimmitt, Steve Bayorgian, John Babo, and Demetrius Troy. Original music, Don Badorf. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Holly Krajewski. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Kenitha Gabler. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, Unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>